so good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. Uh, it is my great privilege to welcome you all to the first webinar, to the opening webinar of this six weeks regional training for measuring SDG 16 in the Pacific. My name is Claudia Pontoglio, and I'm the Associate Research Officer at the UNODC Coastal Center of Excellence for Statistics on Crime and Criminal Justice in Asia and the Pacific, and I will be your moderator today. So this webinar is a joint effort by the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, the United Nations Development Program, the Office, um, the Office of the High Commission for Human Rights, uh, UNICEF, UNESCO, the UN Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, and the Pacific Community. Over the course of the next six weeks, uh, we will cover 20 indicators under SDG 16. We will have experts providing guidance measuring the indicators and a wide range of presentation from national experiences to illustrate how these guidelines work in practice. Before I pass on to the opening remarks, uh, I would like to uh, and officially open this training. I would like to share a, a couple of housekeeping points, which my colleague you might don't mind sharing. Okay, then first of all, we were we are looking forward to your active participation in this training uh, during the sessions as well as online in, uh, in between the sessions on the online platform established for this specific course on this SDG 16 hub. So uh, during the webinars, you can introduce yourselves in the, the chat box and communicate with each other. And if you have any question for the speakers, for the panelists, please use the Q&A box. Uh, at the end of the session, we will ask the panelists the questions that you have asked through the Q&A box and time allowing. And if we cannot, we do not have enough time to reply to all your questions, we will take them uh, on the SDG 16 hub. Uh, so if you haven't already done so, we encourage you to register on the SDG 16 hub through the link that you can find, uh, you will find in uh, this chat and also in the email that you received when you register on this webinar. And you can join the dedicated group that we created for this session, uh, where you will find uh, the webinar recordings, the presentation slides, the agenda, discussions, and questions for each session. And you can also find it on the QR link. Finally, uh, a certificate will be issued to all the participants who attend at least five of the webinars. And I would now like to introduce, to invite uh, Ms. Aparna Basniat, from the SDG 16, um, uh, who is the program advisor for the governance, access to justice and human rights uh, from the UNDP Bangkok Regional Hub. Please, to you. Thanks very much, Claudia. And um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. And warm greetings from Bangkok. Um, it really is a pleasure to welcome you all to this virtual training on measuring SDG 16 in the Pacific. Uh, we are really excited to be hosting this webinar series with our sister agencies uh, and, and partners. So UNODC, UNODC COSTAT, Center of Excellency, OHCHR, UNESCO, UNICEF, ESCAP, and the Pacific community. So over the next six weeks, um, uh, I, you know, we hope to interact with many of you. Um, and it really is incredible to see that we already have uh, over 200 people joining us for this series from the Pacific region and, and beyond. Um, so it, it really shows the importance that you see and the interest and the relevance of SDG 16 in the region. So as you know, SDG 16, the achievement of peaceful, just, inclusive societies is not only a goal in itself, but really uh, critical uh, to drive the entirety of the sustainable development agenda. And this is central, of course, to the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, but it's also a key part of, um, of uh, the Samoa pathway, which looks at the specific situation of small island developing states and their efforts towards sustainable development. Um, in fact, it specifically says in the Samoa pathway that uh, we need to ensure peaceful societies and safe communities uh, including through building uh, responsive, accountable institutions and ensuring access to justice and respect for all human rights, taking into account national priorities and legislations. So we hope that this training uh, series will really provide you with the tools um, that you need to respond to your national priorities and the specific realities in the Pacific region. Um, and we will be covering um, all the SDG 16 indicators that have been prioritized in the region. But taking a step back a little bit, I also wanted to reflect on the broader context that we find ourselves in. So uh, we certainly know that there is a decline in human development globally across all regions, but also in the Pacific. 
and we're facing multiple crises, uh, including in particular uh, the climate crisis, which would puts even more pressure in our systems. And this is you know, particularly acutely felt in the Pacific region. Um, in order to respond to these crises, we really need to think about uh, how we sort of reinforce um, more inclusive, effective, and accountable institutions, and how we can actually look to build more resilient institutions that leave no one behind and, and, and are ultimately um, accountable to the people, right? So in, for us to understand this, what we really need, and this is what the core part of what we're going to be talking about over these six weeks, is data. We need timely reliable, accurate data on governance issues, on human rights issues, on justice, so that we better understand the realities that people are actually facing on the ground. Currently, we're in a situation where we have 40% of SDG 16 global, uh, data available globally. Um, and in the region itself, uh, in, and for, for SIDS in particular, it's only at around 25%. Um, when we look at across the 132 SDG indicators um, in, in the region, uh, we have almost no data on SDG 16. So uh, how do we begin to understand issues like satisfaction with public services or uh, responsive and inclusive decision-making uh, when we have barely any data available at all? So in the course of this webinar series, I hope you will have an opportunity to unpack what all these indicators mean, uh, hear from uh, the experiences across different countries on how they've approached um, measurement of these indicators, um, and the types of tools that you'll have to really strengthen data collection and analysis and reporting in your countries. Um, one of them, and I'm sure my colleagues will go into more detail, is the SDG 16 survey, uh, which really provides you with the methodology uh, to collect data on most of the SDG 16 survey-based indicators, including around violence, justice, and governance issues. And on our side, we really look forward to learning from you and hearing about the work that you have been doing and uh, you know, the questions you have and how we can continue to provide the support that you need uh, on the measurement of these indicators. So uh, let me just end now. Uh, and I just wanted to stress that you know, um, we are all facing different uh, constraints in, in, in sort of push, pushing forward uh, the, the measurement of SDG 16, certainly around resources availability as well. But I would argue that this is the time to invest more on the measurement uh, and the strengthening of national statistics uh, systems to gather the evidence and data we need so that we are be able to make more informed and better decisions on where to invest, uh, how to strength, make progress across, um, diff all across the different indicators and ultimately to improve people's lives. So uh, thank you very much. I hope this will be uh, uh, only the start of the conversation. And uh, and we uh, and I really wish you a successful training course ahead. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing this with us. Uh, I would now like to introduce Julian Garzani, uh, who is the UNODC Deputy Regional Representative for Southeast Asia and the Pacific. Uh, please over to you. Thank you very much, Claudia. Uh, well, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, thank you very much for joining this, this regional training on measuring SDG 16 in the Pacific. I see the attendance is quite, quite high, so I guess interest is high uh, indeed. Um, because it's true, if, if you look at uh, the measurement of SDGs uh, and progress on towards those targets has basically been a challenge from the start. Uh, it was when they were first created, um, and approved the SDGs and with all the, the indicators and the targets, then there was really uh, another discussion that just started is how are we going to measure that? Uh, for some SDGs, it has been a little bit easier uh, compared to others. Uh, and it's true that over time, we, we saw that there was generally an improvement in terms of data generation, collection, analysis, and reporting. So then we were progressively able to, to understand the progress and see progress or not towards, towards these targets. Um, and this is why now we, can, we do have a lot more meaningful reports that are out there, especially those from ESCAP, for instance, um, that are out there to, to measure progress. And if you look at the, the, the Asia Pacific region, uh, out of the, the 112 measurable targets, uh, 
unfortunately just less than 10% uh, are on track. So uh, that is quite unfortunate, but at least you know, we get to know it. Uh, and, and I think uh, still according to, to SCAP, if you look at the, the Pacific, unfortunately, the situation is, is even more challenging in terms of uh, the ability to reach the targets by 2030, uh, to, yeah, 2030. So, <clears throat> and uh, among them, not all SDGs are equal. Um, I think we, what we could see uh, over the, the past years is there was uh, definitely a political commitment to, towards achieving all the SDGs. But when it comes to uh, some SDGs, like SDG 16, for instance, we could see that the statistics, statistics on, on crime, access to justice and governance were, were not necessarily the areas that were prioritized um, in terms of, of collecting data, analyzing, and then reporting. And instead, you know, we're more looking at uh, prioritization of demographic, social, and, and economic statistics instead. Uh, it's true that traditionally, this kind of data has been uh, collected more thoroughly and reported on uh, already in the past. So it was a little bit easier uh, compared to uh, compared to to security or governance related uh, statistics. Um, and, and what we see then is for SDG 16, we clearly do not have enough data. Uh, and when we do have, uh, what we could see is is basically uh, a regression uh, in, in some countries on uh, compared to, to the targets that, that were set. Um, but a, a good question is why don't we have this, this data? I think there are several uh, several explanations. Uh, the, I mean, one of them uh, it could be that these are indeed, uh, in many cases, sensitive data that uh, some ministries may not wish to uh, to make. To make pub, to make them publicly available, which, you know, especially if it shows, for instance, um, a, a trend that is uh, that may uh, make that may lead to, to to think that the country is more sliding towards uh, towards a, a more unstable environment. So that it could be that, uh, and another one is more structural and institutional, um, which where basically the the institutions are in charge of of good governance, of, um, of justice, uh, don't yet have the tools, the systems in place to, to actually collect the data. Uh, and, but on that front, this is where we can help, uh, where you know, systems can be put in place uh, and, uh, and then using the experience of other countries, using experience of, of some other UN agencies, this is something that can be done. And I think this is why the six weeks, uh, the six sessions, sorry, it's not six weeks together, it's six sessions that are consecutive uh, that are starting now are quite important because this is where um, we can look at the, the concepts and the challenges in, uh, in measuring SDG 16, uh, as well as what is out there in terms of methodological tools um, and all of this to basically support the improvement of data collection, analysis and reporting. Um, I believe that over the next uh, weeks, there will be uh, hopefully some very good exchanges um, between, between participants and, and the speakers and also between participants, uh, basically to hear about what the others have been doing, uh, the experience of other countries, uh, and then progressively, hopefully having uh, some sort of a platform. So then we can exchange uh, best practices and also how some challenges have been practically overcome uh, over time. Um, and uh, we, we have started this already some time ago. Uh, for instance, in 2017, the UN and UNDP did, uh, did the first training on, on measuring SDG 16. So the ball keeps rolling um, despite COVID. And, um, and yeah, the, this kind of, uh, of series of events, uh, I think will be will be quite uh, instrumental uh, so we can eventually be able to properly report on SDG 16. Uh, but the ball is in the court of all the participants. So I, uh, I hope you will make good use of, uh, of those sessions. And um, thank you very much for the time that you are dedicating to, um, to attend those, those events. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Julian. And thank you again, Aparna, for setting the scene and uh, explaining why it is so important to measure SDG 16 and to invest in measuring SDG 16. Uh, so now, uh, before moving to the next part, I will, I will see a couple of raised hands and I would like to say, please use the, the chat box that we have on the webinar. And if you have any question for the speaker and panelists, use the Q&A box and we will have a dedicated time to look over at them later. Uh, so now we're moving to the next session of the training, which we will start with a quick poll. Uh, so we, we would like this session to be as interactive as possible, both during the live webinars and in the SDG Hub. So we have prepared a quick poll, which uh, we will put on the screen right now. Okay, so how many indicators are there under SDG 16? Please take your time and uh, input the, put in the answers. This is not a test, I will just give you some time to answer and then we will we'll see the answer later. Okay, I can see that many people have are replying. Okay. Okay, yes, I think many people have voted and I think most people have voted 24 and it is the correct answer. There are 24 goals under, uh, there are 24 indicators under um, SDG 16. We can end the poll. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to the next part of the webinar. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Alison Coping, who is a statistician at the Pacific Community and Chris Ryan, who is a statistician at ESCA, and they will share an overview on an introduction to SD16 in the Pacific and the region, provide a regional overview on the current situation in the Pacific. Thank you, Alison and Chris. Thanks, Claudia, and greetings to you all. Um, I'm Alison from Pacific Community in New Caledonia, and I must apologize because my video has decided not to start at the very unfortunate time when my presentation is starting. So I'm uh, happy to see very familiar faces in the list of participants. So just think back to the last time you heard me talk or saw me in person and just have that picture in your mind as I talk. Um, so as Claudia said, I'll be delivering a brief overview of SDG 16 in the Pacific with my colleague, Chris Ryan, who many of you have also met in previous SDG forums. And on, on the next slide, please. Yes, so what is SDG 16? I think it's fair to say that unlike some of the other goals, which we may be more familiar with, which focus on one development theme, such as SDG 3 on health or SDG 4 on education, SDG 16 is more of a multifaceted um, goal. And I think that's one of the factors why it hasn't had such strong attention as some of the more traditional development themes. I um, mean, particularly in the Pacific region, there's been so much advocacy and attention and interest in SDG 14 on oceans and SDG 13 on climate change, to name a few. But if we just touch on a couple of the aspects then. So the official theme is uh, to promote peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development and provide access to justice for all and build effective, accountable and inclusive institutions at all levels. So a couple of the things that we picked out way back in 2018 in our first regional monitoring report on the SDGs. Um, things like the guarantee of freedom of information. We saw that the adoption of that was low in the Pacific, but that awareness was increasing. And certainly over time, we've seen uh, an increase in data availability with positive answers to that, but there's still a way to go. Another indicator in SDG 16 
which has had a bit more focus in terms of regional support and national efforts has been around birth registration and the safeguard to individual rights. But if I'm honest, I think a lot of the push for this indicator or the improvement and progress in this indicator has come from the, the data and statistics side. So the interest in having birth and death numbers to do population work rather than it being seen and its true value as an SDG 16 indicator for human rights. Uh, next slide, thanks. So those that have been around in the SDG space in the Pacific will be familiar with the fact that at the regional level, we did prioritise the global set of indicators into what we call the Pacific set. Um, and that was a directive from our Pacific leaders to come up with a more manageable framework. So this slide just shows you of the 12 um, global SDG targets for SDG 16, which ones made it into our Pacific set. Um, so seven out of the 12 targets were identified. But of course, at the country level, it's totally up to you as to what's nationally relevant. Um, but of course, often that decision cannot be made until you see some data to see whether it is an issue or not. Next slide. So converting those targets into the indicators which sit underneath the targets. We actually find we have eight of the SDG 16 indicators. And thankfully from that very recent poll, I know that there were 24 in total. Um, so if you look at what indicators we have, again, you can see it's a, a mix across different topics and themes. Again, we've got some violence indicators, some reporting of that violence, uh, a budgetary indicator, a representation in national institutions, proportions believing decision-making is inclusive and responsive, the birth registration indicator, freedom of information, and the last indicator through our regional process, a proxy indicator was developed. It's a simplification of the, the global definition. I think if we were to look at this prioritization exercise again now, I think there's certainly a lot more information and awareness around some of the other targets in SDG 16, such as the Pacific being a transit corridor for illicit drugs and chemical precursors to the lucrative markets in New Zealand and Australia. And we're starting to see, thankfully small scale, but some of that spill over into local markets in places such as Fiji and Vanuatu. Uh, so next slide. And we've heard from the um, introductory speeches, again, the importance of data and most the relative lack of information against SDG 16. And I think part of that comes back, as was talked about, that we do need data from so many sources. So it's not just our traditional household surveys, our census, our heist, our mix, and our, our um, sort of human service administrative data sets, which we rely on here. We also have to look at legislation, documents, government fiscal reports, national parliament representation, ministry of justice, police, and health data. Um, so there's, a need for SDG 16 to be tackled well beyond the National Statistics Office. 
and it goes much broader into the national statistical system. So if we are to improve our reporting situation in the region, we really need our associated agencies and ministries to participate in this process. So I'm very, very heartened to see from the comments as people joined what agencies they're from. And I think through this workshop series that we will certainly improve our standing going forward. So I'll now pass over to Chris to look at some of the um, data availability results. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Alison. Hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, so, so what I'm gonna do for the second half of this presentation is just continue on from that last slide where Alison introduced the issue of data availability, but it also got mentioned quite well in the, the welcoming remarks from Aparna and Julian, where they, they touched on you know, the, the problem with uh, data collection for Goal 16 globally, but in particular, it's, it's a bigger issue in the Pacific. And that what I'm gonna show you here is not gonna be all that great news as to how poor data is within the region, but just shows how important a workshop like this is. So hopefully you know, over the course of the next few weeks, we can address some of these, these issues. So this graph that I'm showing to kick things off, there are the, the 24 indicators down the side. And what, what it's showing using the, the global data, which is collected by the custodian agencies for these indicators, how many Pacific Island countries have sufficient data to monitor progress, how many just have insufficient data, a little bit, but insufficient, i.e. one data point, and how many countries have no data at all. So sufficient data means we've got at least two data points. So we can provide a, an indication of how progress is going in that particular country, whether things are getting better or worse. So you, you can see there, it's, there's a lot of gray there. So that's, that's straight away telling us is we're lacking data in a large number of these indicators across goal 16. Uh, in fact, there's about seven indicators in, in total out of the 24, which we have no data for. Uh, and five of them we're going to be covering throughout the, the course of this workshop series. So that's great. Hopefully we can address that issue over the next few weeks. And there's only about six indicators for which at least half the countries in the Pacific have data for. So it's a, it's a little bit of a, a grim situation for us, but hopefully something that can be rectified. Also a little bit grim, one of the things that SCAP do uh, when we provide reports on progress against the SDGs, at the, the regional level or sub-regional level, we provide this analysis to show how, uh, or sub-regions like the Pacific, how they're going in progressing against the indicators for which we have sufficient data for. Now, Unfortunately for goal 16, there's only three indicators where we can actually show how things are, are progressing. And this is for the subset of not for the Pacific because the Pacific includes Australia and New Zealand. But if we were just to pull out the Pacific uh, small island developing states, the Pacific SIDS, there's only three indicators for which we can tell a story for. And to make matters worse, for those three indicators, we are regressing, we're going backwards uh, against the three. So the three are intentional homicides, uh, 1611, unsentenced detainees, 1632, and then government expenditures, 1661. If things were progressing, we would see a blue line heading towards where the marker is showing 2024 there. So what I want to do now is actually show for, for those two indicators for which we do have sufficient data, what, what the story is showing. So I'm going to start off with 16.3.2, uh, which was unsentenced detainees. And I've got Australia and New Zealand back in here just to, to build up the numbers a little bit. But you can you can see here we've got data for three particular years going back to 2005. Uh, but in, in those assessments, we, we're trying to look in more recent years, especially going back to 2015. So if we want to get a picture for how a region or a country's doing in the last few years, we're focusing probably more on the, the red and the yellow bar. So for, there's about 12 countries listed there, and there's around seven countries where the, 
the yellow bars got a little bit higher. So that's why we're, we're showing that we're regressing a little bit against unsentenced detainees for the, the region. The next one, this isn't the best graph I've ever produced in my life. It looks very messy and it's a bit hard to, to make sense of, but it's, it's using what data we had available for 16.1.1 on intentional homicides. So I've, I've excluded uh, Australia and New Zealand from here and also excluded Papua New Guinea because there's a large number of intentional homicides in PNG. And if I, if I included that country, everything would be squashed down the, the bottom and you couldn't see the trends. But what, what you can see here is, you know, once again, we're, we're missing a lot of data, especially in recent years. For some, from about 2013 onwards, we're not getting too many data points. But you can still see some trends that's going up and down. And in general, it's sort of increasing a little bit. And for the countries we've included in this bit of analysis, it's the, the Solomons and, and Fiji, which are a little bit higher than some of the other countries. But I guess a key message here, for, for most countries in the Pacific, there's less than 10 cases uh, per annum on, on this particular issue. So it's, it's not a massive concern for the Pacific region. The next bit of analysis I just want to show you relates to 16.9.1. So this is a proportion of births registered uh, with a civil authority. So things are looking quite decent here. Where this this data didn't come from at the, the SCAP SDG gateway. It came from the Pacific Data Hub, which SPC oversee. Uh, but as you can see there, we've got a, about 11 countries in total and, and three of them, the, the Cook Islands, New Caledonia and New A, have all recorded 100% births being registered, uh, which is very, very encouraging. It's only Western Samoa, which or, or Samoa, which are down a little bit, but even still, they're, they're at 60%. Uh, one of the indicators in the, the SDGs linked to this is in, in 1719.2, which measures the, the proportion of countries that have achieved 100% birth rate. So that's pretty much the target for this indicator. We want all countries to have 100% birth registration. So I think the Pacific's doing very well on this particular indicator, especially given we've got a number of countries that are already there and uh, a large number not too far behind. Now, I haven't been able to show much analysis because for a lot of the indicators, we don't have two or more data points. So it's a bit hard to show you know, how the trends are going, but I just wanna just show you one of the other things that SCAP have up on our SDG gateway, and we'll be able to provide you with a link later. But, but this is a new bit of analysis which we've been putting together. And I'm just going to show you snapshots from three countries. And so I apologize to the others, which I, I won't be showing. But you'll be able to easily go into the gateway and have a look for your own country and see what we do have for, for goal 16 uh, against your country. So this, this bit of analysis on the side, and hopefully you can see it okay, and you're uh, computer screens back in the office. It, it basically you, you click on the country up the, the the top and goal sixteen, and it'll bring up each of the indicators for which we have some data for for your particular country. Uh, then it'll do a little bit of analysis. Sorry, it'll provide the the data with a little bit of analysis on the side, and then give a, a trend assessment over to the far right. So in the cases where we've just got one data point, you'll see a grey dot or a big, big grey dot, uh, but we'll still provide the latest value that we had uh, for that particular indicator. And if we happen in the last few years to have two or more data points, we'll try and give an indication of to, as to whether things are, are getting better or worse. So here we're looking at Fiji, uh, and you can see from one of the indicators under 16.22 and also under 16.32, things have been on the improve a little bit, as well as 16A1, but things are going or regressing slightly under 16.71. There's two indicators uh, or two series which have been produced for that particular indicator. So I encourage you to, to have a look at this for your own countries and you, give you a bit of an idea what's been reported on the, the global stage for indicators uh, within your country. And I just want to make mention at this point, I mean, you'll most certainly have additional indicators within your country which haven't been collected yet by the custodian agencies of these indicators and reported to the, the global database. So if, you, if you're seeing some 
figures back home, which you're not seeing here on, on this particular website, that's that's why I'm, I'm only showing indicators which have been collated by the custodian agencies and, and passed over to SCAP. So that's, that's the situation for Fiji. Uh, we also got a similar one. This is uh, an example of what it looks like for Samoa. So very similar situation, about the same number of indicators. We've got at least one data point for. A couple of the indicators are, are on the improve, a couple not so much. Uh, and here's just a, another example for Kiribati. Uh, here we've probably less indicators we're able to tell a story for. There's more, more gray dots there, but you know, once again, we've got we've got some values for about 10 or so indicator series there. So I just wanted to, to show uh, those last couple of slides to give you an indication what we do have, even though it's limited. And hopefully, as a, through courtesy of this workshop and a lot more effort from each of you online, we can improve uh, this data availability situation. But that's all from me. If, if, uh, if they, I'm not sure if we're having questions at the end of each session, Cordy, but Alison and I would happy to answer any questions if there are some. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Chris. Thank you, Alison. Yes, we will have a dedicated session for uh, replying to the questions at the end of this uh, session. And if there is any other thing, any other question that comes up in um, during the, in the following days or that we cannot answer today, we encourage you to write it on SG16 Hub. So we where we you will get the chance to talk to the panelists as well. Uh, so now we will have uh, a quick poll, uh, the second quick poll of the session. Uh, which actually relates to the, the points that personalism were making about the indicators in the Pacific. If my colleague can quickly put a poll. Okay, yes. So we talked about how many polls have uh, data in the Pacific, but in the Pacific, what's the percentage of indicators with sufficient data uh, in 2021? Is it 12%, uh, 27%, 38%, or 40%? And this is according to the ESCAP report. We will give you some more, not too much time. Okay, I can see that most people, many people have applied. Thank you. I see that most people have actually voted 12%, but it is actually, uh, a better percentage. We have in the Pacific, there were 38% in total of SDG indicators that have sufficient data in 2021. So it is actually better than most people have uh, voted. Still there is, as mentioned previously in the sessions, there is still a lack of data that needs to be worked on and which is why we're really uh, happy to be doing this uh, webinar series. Okay, now we can start the second part of the, the next part of this webinar series, which is presentations delivered by uh, SDG 16 custodian agencies who will deliver a presentation on the methodological tools and data collection that they have. We have the first presentation coming up by uh, Guillermo Bernardo Dutra, Miranda Dutra, who is the human rights officer at the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner of Human Rights, who will deliver a presentation on the methodological tools and data collection for human rights statistics. Uh, Guillermo, you have 10 minutes, please over to you. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much, Claudia. I hope you can see my presentation. Yes, we can. Perfect. So hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining today. Uh, as uh, Claudia introduced me, my name is Guilherme Leonardo Dutra. I'm a statistician working with the Human Rights Indicators and Data Unit with the Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights in Geneva, Switzerland. And I'm going to be presenting um, the SDG indicators that OHCHR is custodian and that we're going to talk later in future sessions and also present a bit what it means, human rights statistics, and what's the work we're doing to, to improve availability of human rights statistics worldwide. So here's an overview of our work. Uh, so the core of our work is uh, human rights indicators. 
So we make available relevant, robust, and internationally comparable indicators on the human rights environment by all. And I'm going to explain soon what does it mean uh, and what does it mean in practice, this work. But also, besides the, the specific collection for human rights indicators, we we're, we're also work on something called the human rights-based approach to data, which is basically including human rights in the thinking process, in the planning process of all data collection uh, 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 initiatives, regardless if this is related to human rights data or not. So our work is directly with national stakeholders to foster institutional collaboration and create accountability. So we provide technical support to countries. So we're available to provide technical support uh, uh, to your institution as well in terms of uh, mainstreaming human rights within the, the data collection uh, at, the, at, the, at your institution. And we work uh, with people and their communities. We work with human rights defenders. Uh, we bring together uh, uh, institutions, uh, governmental institutions with communities to reach the best and, and most human rights, uh, uh, most human rights acceptable way of collecting data and improving the conditions of, of communities. So human rights indicators, they are specific information on the state of an event, activity, or an outcome that can be related to human rights norms that addresses and reflects the human rights concerns and principles, and that is used to assess and monitor promotion and protection of human rights. So I'd like to invite you to access this link where you can access the guidelines for implementing human rights indicators at the national level. There's a list of illustrative indicators. So in practical terms, for example, these indicators can be included within the monitoring systems that you already have in place or the, 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 the strategic plans that you have in, a, in, a, in your country to make sure that you're measuring progress towards human rights. And, and I think it's also important to highlight that compared to many of the areas that are gonna be discussed here this week, human rights statistics is a, is a relatively recent area. In the most recent uh, UN Statistics Commission uh, session, it was decided that human rights statistics, it was included as part of the international classification. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an emerging area in the sense that there's an international awareness of the importance of collecting these human rights statistics as a cross-cutting uh, a field similar to gender statistics, for example, which is uh, a more, more established for, for a longer time. So the human rights-based approach to data uh, includes six key principles, participation, disaggregation, self-identification, transparency, privacy, and accountability. So these are principles that must guide all data collection initiatives, as I said, regardless if they are, uh, if, regardless if they are for collecting human rights data or not. And this guideline as well, which is available online, uh, you you can identify you can find this uh, the description of these principles and I like to highlight the principle of disaggregation. This is the core principle. Uh, so a lot of our work involves identifying the groups left behind and trying to work towards uh, data collection systems that are inclusive of these groups so we can understand uh, the reality. These are the four SDG 16 indicators under uh, OHC Jars custodianship. So conflict-related deaths, 16 on two. This is a very context-specific indicator that applies to contexts where there are armed conflict. So it's the number of conflict-related deaths per 100,000 population by sex, age, and cause. Uh, killings and other attacks against human rights defenders, journalists, and trade unionists, with 16 and one. This is applicable to all countries. So all countries should report, um, and we work with countries to, to find the best way of collecting this data, which is, imagine, is a very challenging uh, very challenging, very sensitive uh, topic. Uh, we have also a structure indicator that the 16A1, which is the independent national human rights institutions. So it's the existence of independent national human rights institutions in compliance with the Paris principles. This is a fairly straightforward indicator. So it's identifying the, uh, in the countries that have in NHRIs, national human rights institutions that have been accredited by the process, uh, the internal process of OHC jar that uh, analyzes if these institutions follow the Paris principles. And finally, a survey-based indicator, the 10 through 1, 16 b one which is the prevalence of discrimination and harassment. So it's the proportion of population reporting having personally felt discriminated against or harassed in the period of 12 months on the basis of a ground of discrimination prohibited under international human rights law. So as I mentioned, this is a survey-based indicator. So we support countries on, 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 we have a technical guidance on the best way to approach these, this indicator, how to include these questions within uh, national surveys, 
social service already ongoing or how to implement Mix, which is a, a main source also for many countries for the data for this indicator. And I'm going to discuss in, in future sessions more in detail. I wanted to bring to your attention this recent project we, we are currently working on. This is on the 1612, the conflict related deaths. So um, this is a project for estimation on conflict related deaths in Syria. And, and this applies, this, this logic applies to all other indicators. We take the indicator data uh, as a, the starting point for a series of other projects. So uh, let's say that the, the indicator data, it's part of a global commitment uh, of reporting this, but we don't want to stop there. We want to see this SDG data being really used for practical benefits. So in the case of Syria, we have been using the, the, the SDG indicator 16 and 2 for Syria as a starting point for a very advanced uh, estimation of the undocumented deaths. And this was uh, here, there are the new articles that have picked up this, this, this news which showcase the, the, the interest of, of, of having this, this human rights data and SDG 16 data in general more available. Uh, for understanding the reality of peace and security worldwide. So in this project, we, we as I said, we took as a starting point the SDG indicator data, and then we, we carry out a data science project using a variety of methods, including NLP and MSC, to have a very clear outlook on what's happening in Syria. And this way, we can, we can do the trend analysis, and this data can be used for research. I invite you to access the report to take a look on this data. Uh, it's all publicly available and has been reported as well for the SDG database this year to be, to be very accessible for everyone who's interested in understanding better the, 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 the reality of conflict in Syria. And finally, my last slide, um, I wanted to highlight one of the main works, uh, main lines of work and the way we work is through the signing of memoranda of understanding between the national human rights institutions and the national statistics office. Sometimes the dialogue is not that straightforward, Sometimes uh, statisticians and human rights um, lawyers or uh, practitioners or advocates think they are working on different topics, but that's not the case. And so through these MOUs, we manage to bring everyone uh, around the table. We facilitate these processes to improve human rights data collection, especially because a lot of human rights data comes from the national human rights institutions, which are doing this monitoring. But of course, the compilation of official statistics and the understanding about statistics comes from the national statistics offices. So through this memorandum of understanding, we, we, facilitate, uh, we facilitate this data sharing, uh, sharing experiences. And this is, uh, these are processes also that we could facilitate in your, in your, in your context, in your, in your in your institution, if you believe it's uh, it's uh, it's applicable and 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 relevant, and would be happy to to support you on, on this. So that's all from from me from for, for now. We're gonna meet again in a in a couple of sessions, and we remain available to by email. And I invite you also to access our website on human rights indicators, or you can find a little bit more about the work uh, we're doing. So thank you, thank you very much. Uh, back to you, Claudia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ken. Uh, now we will get over to the next presentation. Uh, I would like to introduce Mariana Neves, who is the Governance Statistics Specialist at the UNDP Oslo Governance Center. Uh, the floor is yours, Mariana. Thank you so much, Claudia. Uh, so I'm really honored to be here today. Uh, Claudia just told me a few seconds ago that uh, in addition to the 88 that we can see, there's some colleagues that are also watching together uh, in some rooms, so it's really, really happy to, to be here and uh, discuss with you. Uh, so today we're, we'll be speaking in a similar presentation as my colleague Guilherme. So this is the general uh, tools that we have. Uh, I'll be uh, speaking on the custodianship, which means the indicators that we at uh, UNDP are responsible for. The SDG 16 survey, the prior group on governance statistics, and very briefly on the SDG 16 hub. Um, first on the custodianship, one of the initial presentations showed that there are certain indicators that were selected for the Pacific. Uh, from those indicators, both were selected, we have inclusive representation public service, inclusive representation the judiciary, and inclusive response to decision making. So we have we are responsible for two more indicators. One is 1633 on access to dispute resolution mechanism, 
that is new. It was only added in uh, 2020, and your selection process was on 2017, if I'm not mistaken. And as also it was emphasized, this is the those that were selected for the region, but the candidates can also have their selection inside. So that's why we'll be also covering 1662, which is selection with public service. Just a little bit on the new indicator, the 1633, you had already selected 1613, uh, um, which is a physical section and psychological violence, the vi you have violence reporting. So it is a lot on, uh, on the criminal side, how many people are reporting uh, certain offenses. So this indicator 1633 goes to the civil side. It complements the first uh, uh, indicator. During the, this uh, weeks, in the week four, we'll go through each one of them more carefully. Another thing we wanted to share with you is that every year we'll request uh, countries to share the data. This year we request again in June, so the several statistical offices will receive an email from us. You might also receive some data that we have found uh, either on your websites, uh, on some reports that we'll be requesting you to, to validate for those we have. So you tell us if this is correct or if there's any changes. And our call for data usually, again, the emphasis is we'll ask on all indicators, but I'm emphasizing the three that it, uh, they have been prioritized in your region. So we'll request you to collect the data to tell us which data you have for this indicator. We'll be asking you uh, the metadata. So that means how the indicator was produced for your specific country, uh, but also the, the indicator itself. Now, a lot of our colleagues before me have emphasized the insufficiency of data. Uh, and this is, as we said, it's the Pacific, but globally, uh, we have uh, low data availability. Some indicators we have a little bit more uh, than the others. So even though the COSHR and UNDP, all three custodians of some indicators, they found that we are performing a little bit better on the, the administrative the record indicators. One, because a lot of the indicators existed before the framework. Uh, as Glenn was saying, there are some parts of, of uh, the statistical data production that have just been uh, uh, recognized as part of the official statistics. That's the case of human rights that only this March was recognized, but also governance statistics that it was only this much, it was recognized in a statistical activity, a sector of the statistical activity. On the household surveys, more, a lot of indicators are not so new. And we found that uh, one, some did not have a methodology. Two, if, for those who have methodology, maybe it was not of uh, knowledge from, to several uh, NSOs because either they have more experience in economic statistics, other type of social statistics. So there was a lot uh, that needed to be done. And also we needed to some way harmonize between ourselves. So the three agencies decided to invest in developing a methodology, a survey uh, that would cover most of the survey-based indicators under SDG 16. And through that, to develop this survey, we have consulted, uh, we did an extensive desk review on several national, regional, and global experiences of measuring SDG 16. So we could learn from you. It's not just from us to show you how it's done, but more important, we also learn from what already existed. There was an expert consultation on the indicators so that means that we, uh, several countries were uh, contributed uh, by reviewing the, the tools, make it see if, it's, if it may, they make sense, they apply to the several realities. We did a cognitive testing, which means that uh, for, because some indicators are a little bit more sensitive or because they have certain peculiarity, we needed to know how do they perform 
in the in the field, for instance, some indicators that will be covered by our UNODC colleagues later on on sexual violence. Do we need to know how people respond to these indicators? And we, and it is also one indicator that you have selected. So we went through this. We piloted in eight countries, including a six, which is uh, Cape Verde. It's an, it's an African seat. Um, in general. Uh, the, all of the pilots went well. There we found some things that we also needed to improve. For instance, we needed more guidelines, a certain type of indicator. That's why you also have the questionnaire and implementation map. And in 2022, the survey was welcomed by the United Nations Statistics Commission, which includes uh, all, all, also all of the Pacific countries. Um, so this makes it formal and also shows that uh, we are faced with a very uh, comprehensive package. And this package now uh, is available to the member states. So the package that it uh, is uh, built upon uh, six models. So access to justice, corruption, discrimination, governance, violence, human trafficking. Uh, we have under each model, several indicators, some have more, some have less. Uh, for instance, the violence pack is the one who has more indicators, but the governance has very interesting indicators as well. So the satisfaction public server that actually goes, we have been in the entire framework, we also always measure uh, or frequently measure the quantity of things. Uh, here we are measuring the experience of the of the population faced the service provided by the state. Uh, the bribery is another indicator. Discrimination that it was not selected uh, as a priority indicator, but is a very very uh, relevant uh, indicator. Uh, of course, this is again. It's a, a the selection of each country and each region if it should or should not. So. Considering these models, the survey was created to respond uh, to three to types of situation. One is the country has no data on uh, survey-based indicators, then they do a full implementation of the survey if they wish and if they have the capacity. In some cases, uh, there is already a survey uh, being conducted in the country, then you can adjust your methodology to be able to produce the, the SDG 16 indicators. And the third one is you don't need all the models for some reason, either because you're national priority, because that it, at that moment, there is a specific area that you need more urgently. For instance, you might need bribery more urgently or another uh, data. So in this case, it's possible to integrate one model on an ongoing survey. So this is the, the, the models, or this is the structure for the SG16 survey. And as we go in the several presentation, you see each indicator more in depth. Another area that UNDP works is the prior group on governance statistics. So what I showed on the SG16 survey is only for the SG indicators, but the prior group works on the broader governance. So you see all the dimensions on your left, are the several dimensions what we call governance for statistics. And at this moment, they are developing the, the methodology for the survey and for administrative records on each of those. There are two that are more advanced and they're uh, entering the pilot stage, which is on non-discrimination in quality on one side, on the other side on participation. Um, and we'll, if they're interested and um, it will be, I think they'll be very welcome to also have representation from a region. Last is the SG16 Server Hub, which is not a tool, it's a platform, but as my colleague Claudia uh, told you, you're invited to see, we'll have a lot of information on conference, on training, we have reports, blogs, guided materials. Uh, as uh, Claudia also mentioned, you'll see the, the materials of this workshop. So if you go to the page, you'll see the regional training just uh, on your right side. You just click register and you can enter the space. Uh, I thank you so much for the for the time, and I'll be speaking with you again, presenting other indicators later on on the train. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you so much for this presentation, Mariana. Uh, now we'll go to the next presentation, which will be uh, my colleague Jisoo Kim, the Data Analysis Officer at the UNODC Costa Center of Excellence. Uh, please, Jisoo, over to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Claudia. Can you use me? So I will quickly share my screen. Okay, thank you. So as Claudia introduced me, my name is Jisoo Kim, and I'm working with Claudia at like, UNODC Costa Center of Excellence for Statistics in Asia and Pacific. And it's really great, like, great pleasure to be here and meet you all even virtually. So today I would like to talk about the work that UNODC has been doing to improve data availability, especially on crime and criminal justice field. And my presentation has like two main parts. Like first, I'll give you an overview of data collection for crime statistics. And secondly, uh, some of the key methodology tools will be introduced. So yeah, UNODC is custodian or co-custodian of 11 indicators under GORE 16. So these indicators are aiming to monitor violence, rule of law, access to justice, corruption, and other relevant crime related data area. So we are using mainly two data sources to measure these indicators, administrative data or survey-based data. For example, intentional homicide and sentence detained indicators should be measured using data from administrative records, like produced by police, a prosecutor office, or other law enforcement agencies. And prevalence of violence, like perception of safety and reporting of violence, should be measured using data from survey, such as Wikimedia surveys, corruption survey, or as Mariana already introduced, like SDG 16 survey initiative. So, and there is one indicator. So we need both administrative and survey data, like human trafficking indicator. So over the next six weeks, we will have a chance to talk about each indicator in more detail. So what is the concept and definition, which methodology we can use and how to calculate and how to report. And this chart shows how UNODC working on supporting countries to produce crime and criminal justice statistics including data for measuring SDG 16 indicators. So at the bottom of the screen, you see a range of methodological tools developed by UNODC in partnership with other UN agencies. I also want to highlight that our member state, like all of you here, has been also involved in the process of developing these tools, you know, sometimes by providing your national experience, comments, or feedback, and or like participating in piloting process. So we have been working together with many countries across the world to develop these tools to help you to produce crime data. So please feel free to use them as much as possible. And we are here to help you. So yeah, back to the chart. Yeah, using these internationally standard tools, like countries can produce more reliable and comparable data, both administrative data and survey data. Then this data is used to measure SDG indicators in SDG indicator. And then UNODC compiles crime and criminal justice data from all member states, including SDG 16 indicators data. And as a custodian agency, we report to the UNSD for global monitoring SDG. And now I will give you more information about like highlighted tools, like four of them in more detail. The first is the ICCS, so International Classification of Crime for Statistical Purposes. So as you can see with the name, it is a classification of criminal offenses based on internationally agreed concepts, definitions, and principles, and is endorsed by the UN Statistical Commission and UN Crime Commission in 2015. As you may know crime data is often based on the criminal code or legal code and each country has different legal system and even within a country there is no uniform way of producing crime data between like criminal justice process such as like police investigation prosecution conviction and imprisonment so these inconsistencies and incomparabilities between countries and many of the cases within the countries prevent us from 
analyzing and disseminating the crime and criminal justice data, which is essential for evidence-based policymaking and then achieving SDG 16. So the ICCS addresses these issues by providing a comprehensive framework to produce crime statistics. The offenses are grouped in a meaningful and systemic, uh, systematic way, and it has hierarchical structure whose categories are mutually exclusive and exhaustive. And the description of the criminal offense is provided in terms of the behavior shown by perpetrators of a crime, rather than legal code. So it allows yeah, to be applicable across jurisdictions. And in, in addition to this, the ICCS also provides important disaggregating variables to capture contextual information, such as a victim perpetrator relationship, situational context, and et cetera. And now I want to talk about victimization survey and the manual of victimization surveys that UNODC and UN Economic Commission for Europe has developed. So victimization survey is aiming to capture the real extent of the crime and operation of a criminal justice system in a country by asking people's perception and experience on crime and security through the household survey. So the value of the victimization survey is not only collecting the information that reported to or detected by authorities, but it also collecting the information from those who were not a victim or who were a victim but didn't report or couldn't report for some reasons, so-called dark figure of crime. So through the victimization survey, we will fill a gap in the generation of high quality and comparable data to be measured mainly these five SDGs indicators, prevalence of all forms of violence, perception of safety, access to justice, and bribery, and so on. So this manual, the manual on victimization survey, provides you a comprehensive source of information about how to plan the victimization survey, how to implement the interview, how to analyze data, and how to disseminate the final report, the final result, addressing different considerations, constraints at each stage of implementing like process that you may encounter. So therefore, if there is a country where they are embarking on a survey of this like certain topic for the very first time, it is the guideline that we prepare for helping you. And the other methodological tool for today is Manual on Corruption Survey, the joint initiative of UNODC, UNDP, and our sister center, UNODC Center of Excellence in Mexico. The corruption surveys are also sample surveys to collect information on the prevalence of bribery and other forms of collusion, and measure modalities and scope of bribery, as well as public attitudes towards corruption and anti-corruption at national, subnational, and local level. So the manual consists of like four main parts, starting from the background and context of the corruption measurement. Next, it outlines the general methodology for developing and implementing the corruption survey. Last two parts are dedicated to each of corruption survey among different target population, like general population and business. It also provides you with examples of questionnaires for both population and business surveys. So you can see how the questions can be formulated for SDG 16.5.1 and 16.5.2. So next week, yeah, we will have an opportunity to explore, explore these two indicators. So you will be very much welcome to join us next Thursday at the same time, at the same, same time. And finally, I'd like to introduce the United Nations Crime Trend Survey, USCTS. And it is a mandated annual questionnaire for UN member states to manage data collection and dissemination on crime and criminal justice system in line with the ICCS. So every year, UNODC sends out this worldwide questionnaire to countries through national focal points, which are appointed by member states. So as of 2022, we relied on a network of around 130 national focal points across the world. And the low role of focal points is to coordinate with all the relevant institutions within a country 
and ensure a timely, accurate, and complete response of the UNCTS at a national level. When UNODC received the UNCTS from UNCTS data from member states, we review the data communicating with the national poker points, not only by us. Once it's verified, UNODC disseminates data via UNODC data portal for everyone to assess and utilize these data for research, like for research and other works. And UNODC also is doing global research on crime issues based on these data. The CTS data is used for monitoring progress toward the SDG goal 16 as well, so at an international level. So we report data for eight SDG 16 indicators to UNSD for global monitoring as a custodian agency. Apart from like this, the UNCTS serves as an instrument for member states to collect a core set of data that will help identify crime patterns and trends, assess the functioning of criminal justice system. So what I'm saying is, it's a great tool that country can utilize as a guideline for harmonizing the crime statistics production system in a country. So more information can be found the link that at the bottom, like on the screen. So therefore feel free to assess and have a look. So this is what I prepare for today. And thank you so much for joining and listening to my presentation and please join upcoming series as well. So very looking forward to meeting you yeah, over the next series and over to you, Claudia. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation, Jiso. I would now like to invite Marius uh, Lucas uh, Yunas, who is the advisor for universal access to information section at the communication and information sector of UNESCO. Please, uh, Marius, over to you. Thank you very much, Claudia, and uh, good, good morning from Paris to everybody. Uh, I'm going to share my screen uh, in, in a sec. I hope I hope you can see it now. Yes, uh, so thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, so I'm Marius Lukosunas, advisor for Universal Access to Information section, uh, and we in UNESCO we are monitoring SDG 16 and 2. So my presentation will be about uh, about that particular um, uh, <clears throat> indicator. Uh, so, uh, from our point of view, why monitoring of SDG 16 and 2 is important. Uh, um, because uh, there are four reasons uh, which we've uh, identified. You can see them on the screen, or uh, I'm not going to go through all of them, uh, but I'd say that the access to uh, <clears throat> having access to information laws is uh, central, uh, central what we are doing and why we are doing it. Uh, and um, uh, here is the next slide, uh, basically, um, why UNESCO is doing that? Uh, it is because we are uh, the custodian agency for SDG 1602. Uh, and um, I just want to remind you that SDG 1602 is about the number of countries that adopt and implement constitutional, statutory, and or policy guarantees for public access to information. At uh, this very moment, we have uh, 137 UN member states, uh, which have adopted legal guarantees for access uh, access to information. This is the data of the beginning of this year. <clears throat> now, um, why uh, access uh, uh, access to uh, the, the, there are a lot of links between SDG 16 and 2 and other SDGs. Uh, here is the slide uh, which just uh, un, uh, unpacks uh, the link between 16.10.2 and 16.7, responsive, inclusive, participatory, and representative decision making. Uh, of course, access to information as a tool uh, is important uh, in the fight against corruption. Also, uh, and we are we are, and there are many other. Uh, cross-cutting uh, points, but uh, I'm not going to go through all of them. Uh, I'm just uh, illustrating with this slide uh, that 1610.2 uh, 
uh, is uh, not only important by itself, but also it has a lot of, it provides a lot of uh, support to, um, to the implementation of other, um, other targets and indicators of this particular uh, goal. Uh, now, what is UNESCO strategy? Uh, of course, we do a lot of advocacy. Uh, we do capacity development, but in my presentation, here, uh, I would focus more on uh, point three, which uh, we call uh, progress assessment. It is basically uh, producing annual reports uh, on SDG 16.10.2. All of them are on our website. Uh, and these reports uh, are based on data, which we collect uh, through the survey. Uh, and the survey is uh, the key uh, the key to collect the data and to report and to monitor and to improve. Uh, so UNESCO survey on SDG 16, uh, 16.10.2 uh, looks at the following uh, principles of access to information. Uh, as mentioned, legal frameworks, also oversight mechanisms. I'm here unpacking the metadata a little bit. Uh, appeals mechanisms. Uh, record keeping and reporting, and um, we are specifically focusing on limited scope of exemptions uh, because exemptions are exemptions are. Uh, this is the area where we uh, sort of uh, limit access to information, as you know. Uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, so. Uh, for a moment, uh, 2022 survey, we are finishing uh, 2023 survey, but it's not has, it, it, it was not, it is not finished yet. For a moment in 2022, we had 123 countries uh, participating in the, in the survey. Now, what is this? Well, what is our survey? What it is about? It is composed of two sections. Uh, first, adoption of access to information laws, and second, implementation of access to information laws. As you've seen when I was talking uh, very quickly about the, uh, the um, metadata, implementation from our point of view is, uh, is, is, is a very important part of uh, any law, and this law in particular. Um, now, uh, the survey comprises of eight questions. Uh, each with a value between zero and two. Uh, and upon the completion of the survey, a country can get a total score of uh, from zero to eight, enabling uh, us to track the progress over time. Um, and uh, the questions were based on principles uh, which highlight effective implementation of AT, uh, access to information at the country level. And uh, they are synthesized from existing frameworks and documents recognized internationally. Now, uh, just uh, to, to, to be more specific, uh, here are the eight questions. Uh, some of them have uh, sub-questions also, but I'm not going to go into that kind of detail. Everything is available on UNESCO website. We have a manual uh, which guides uh, the uh, through, through the survey, how to answer these questions, what is important, what is not, and so on and so forth. Uh, and as you can see, we start with a question of existence uh, of the uh, legal guarantee. Uh, and then we go into implementation, into exemptions, uh, and um, data storage, and so on and so forth, and oversight institutions, of course. Now, uh, our main, uh, so to say, focal points uh, uh, are um, <clears throat> different bodies, but a majority of them are uh, access to information, oversight, and appeals bodies. Not every country has these. Uh, the legal models uh, vary from country to country, uh, but uh, but uh, the uh, oversight and appeals bodies are uh, are key in uh, not only in the implementation in many countries, but also in participating in the survey and providing us with the, uh, with the data. Uh, now, as I've mentioned. Uh, I want to uh, focus on two last points. Uh, as I've mentioned, we, we sometimes add a sub-question 
um, we, we have that possibility within question six, I think. And in 20 to, uh, 2022, the sub question was on uh, specific uh, guarantees uh, which uh, promote uh, gender equality uh, within access to information context, within the context of legal frameworks, of course. And uh, this year, the survey has not uh, been finalized yet, but we are looking into the ICT uh, platforms. What I mean is, uh, I'll explain with the next uh, with the next slide, and I think uh, this is one of the very important uh, areas uh, where, uh, when we are talking about digitalization of different kind of processes. So uh, many access to information oversight bodies, not many, but some, uh, they have developed the possibility to file access to information request uh, through specific ICT platforms. Here you see two. Uh, examples uh, from Canada and from Mexico, uh, where basically you file your information request and it you can follow it as if when you are uh, purchasing something on uh, uh, on internet and uh, you get notifications, what is the status of your request? And of course also uh, these platforms help you to select a right government agency to which information requests should go. Uh, so, in addition to gender, in addition to in 2020, we were focusing specifically on uh, persons with disabilities and special clauses which enable them to use access to information legal frameworks. Uh, this year, we are trying to focus also on uh, how to uh, make use of the digital uh, digital uh, platforms and digital tools uh, to enhance access to information. So we are collecting also that data uh, and the survey thus serves not only as a monitoring tool but also as a tool which which sort of signals uh, signals regarding the, the, the good practice. Uh, now, um, what, what uh, when I'm talking about uh, data collection, of course, and monitoring, we are monitoring not just for the sake of the monitoring, but uh, for the sake of improvement. Uh, we strongly believe that what what can be uh, or, or, or that what, what can be measured can be improved. Uh, so here you see uh, one slide which is related to institutional strength. Uh, of the implementation of the legal framework. And you can see, for example, uh, we were trying to, uh, the, uh, uh, on, the, on the left side, you have a type of institution which is e uh, implementing access to information laws in different countries. So there is a big variety from information commissioners to human rights commissions. Uh, and this data uh, gives us possibility to establish a trend uh, which type of institution is sort of not only trendy, but is uh, is uh, most successful in implementing uh, the framework? Because as I've said, the survey is not only about uh, the um, uh, 16 and 2 is not, not just about the framework, but also about the implementation. Uh, here is the list of um, uh, countries which participated in last year's survey. As I've mentioned, uh, there were 123 from uh, Asia Pacific. You have the list again, mm, uh, and I won't stop on it uh, for too long. Uh, and just a uh, <clears throat> few key findings uh, from uh, 2022 survey. Uh, uh, the, the, the finding number, oh, sorry. Uh, uh, so the, 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 there is a finding on record keeping. There is a finding on importance of regional networks. And I want to stop on number three, uh, I think, because uh, I've talked about others more or less. Uh, importance of regional networks. Uh, we are. Uh, I think that uh, for the Pacific region, it's very important to uh, to start the regional cooperation. That's what our survey also shows. Uh, for example, UNESCO is supporting. Uh, established, has supported the establishment of the African Network of Information Commissioners. There are more than 20 institutions. And uh, with this network, the, the regional cooperation has went up. 
so I guess that uh, our uh, our survey is not only uh, is not only uh, as I've said collecting data but also providing uh, important guidance and recommendation uh, for for the member states for the institutions as well as, uh, as uh, for UNESCO uh, where we could focus our activities in the remaining seven years. Uh, of, of SDG, uh, SDG implementation. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for, uh, for listening. Uh, here is my email. Uh, we'll be uh, discussing, uh, we'll be discussing SDG 16 and 2 in the upcoming uh, events within the framework of this uh, training program. Uh, and if you have any questions, please uh, do not hesitate writing to me. Thank you. Back to you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your presentation, Marius. Okay, now we are going to have the final presentation of today, and it will be. Uh, I would like to introduce to you Claudia Kappa, who is the senior advisor and unit chief of the data and analytics unit at UNICEF. Please, Claudia, to you. Thank you so much. And if um, somebody can kindly allow me to share my screen, I think it's been dis disabled. So apologies for, for that. In the meantime, let me start by thanking the other agencies for joining UNICEF uh, today in uh, uh, this webinar about uh, in the, the indicator and the goal 16. As UNICEF, we have uh, three indicators that are uh, concerning children for which we are custodian agencies. So we are gonna talk about a little bit the the background around these indicators. And of course, there's gonna be a dedicated session as it is the case for all the other indicators where we're gonna have a chance to talk about more in details about how we can collect data on the uh, indicators related to children. So in the first part of my presentation, I'm gonna give you an overview of the available data and discuss the data gaps with a focus specifically on the SDG 16.2, which relates to ending all forms of violence against children. And in the second and last part of my presentation, I would like to share with you an overview of the international classification of violence against children that has been recently endorsed by the Statistical Commission in March of 2023. But let me start with an assessment of data gap. And this is how we started this webinar reflecting together on where the region stands when it comes to uh, data available across the different SDGs. But of course, being UNICEF, my focus is on the SDGs that are specifically addressing children. And there are three of them um, displayed in this graph. First of all, the SDG 16.2.1, related to the use of violent discipline against children. Then we have indicator 16.2.3 that relates to sexual violence in childhood. And this indicator uh, is uh, related to women, uh, young women who experience sexual violence in, in their childhood, as well as young men who experience their uh, sexual violence in, in uh, childhood. And then we have the SDG 16.9.1, which has been already talked about, which refers to birth registration. Now, this graph show in dark blue, the proportion of countries in this region without internationally comparable data. And as you can see, the best indicators in terms of coverage, uh, data coverage is birth registration. Yet, there are still 52% of the country, half of the countries in these regions do not have international comparable data produced after 2015 that can be used for monitoring these indicators. But when it comes to the violence-related indicators, the lack of data is really even more significant. We have 70% of countries in the region missing data on violent discipline, so with no data. And when it comes to sexual violence in childhood, which is one of the most egregious child rights violation, you can see that when it comes to women, 78% of countries do not have data. And there is not a single country in the region that has data on the experience of sexual violence in childhood among, among young men, which we know that exist. 
Now, this, this lack of data is despite of very high level of violence uh, in the region. So for example, this is a quick snapshot of the um, percentage of children who experience violent disciplinary practices at home. Spanking, uh, shaking, hitting the child on the head by caregivers. We have data for this set of countries that you can see here, mostly collected through multiple indicator cluster survey and demographic and health surveys. And you can see that in this region, the level of violent discipline is extremely common. It's one of the regions in the world with the highest level of violent discipline. At least 80% of children among the countries with available data experience violent discipline at home on a regular basis. And in countries like Samoa and Kiribati is above 90%. So it's very widespread, it's very common. Hence the need for countries to collect the data at regular intervals, because ultimately the goal is to eliminate all forms of violence uh, against children. So what UNICEF has done in support of country to help countries collect data on violence against children. We gather uh, national statistical offices from over 40 countries trying to understand right after the adoption of the SDGs, why countries did not have data even prior to the SDG since these are child rights violations. And one of the things that came very strongly from the national statistical office was we don't have definitions. There is a confusion around definitions. There are multiple definitions, and therefore we need this clarity. And this is what UNICEF has tried to tackle. We are trying to develop an international statistical classification to help country with definitional issues. It's uh, and this this has been the work that have been uh, have been conducting over the last three to four years, and the ICVAC. Uh, which is the International Classification of Violence Against Children, is the ultimate product of this work. It's the first ever international classification of violence. And of course, we expect that this will have far-reaching implications for data collection at all levels. And I'm not just talking about survey data, I'm also talking about administrative records. The ICVAC was developed with inputs from over 200 experts including representative of more than 50 national statistical office, child rights experts, pediatricians, academics, so on and so forth. It's a hierarchical classification uh, that has two level categories. The categories are mutually exclusive and comprehensive. And I'm glad to, to come after the colleague from UNODC because the ICVAC was built uh, inconsistent with other existing classification, but more specifically, has been built inconsistent and with great support and contribution from UNODC because the intention was to make it consistent with the international classification of crime for statistical purposes. Now, after four years of very intense uh, conversation and debates within these 200 and plus experts, we finally landed on the following definition of violence against children, which include any deliberate, unwanted, and non-essential act, and the act can be threatened or actual, against a child or a group of children that results or has the likelihood of resulting in death, physical pain, or psychological suffering. So violence has to have these four critical components. It has to be an act that is harmful, a deliberate act, unwanted by the child, and non-essential. A non-essential means it's not an act that is justifiable by reasons of fitness or survival. These are the different categories of the violent acts. We have organized category on the basis of the nature of the violent acts. So the international classification regulate homicide, and in this case, fully consistent with the ICCS, non-fatal physical violence, sexual violence, psychological violence, neglect. And of course, we have a category for all other forms of violence. Since I mentioned the ICCS, I want to explain why we created the ICVAC if there was already the ICCS. Well, because in, in many countries, not all forms of violence are actually regulated as crimes. 
including corporal punishment in many countries is still legal. So we cannot really limit the forms of violence that are regulated as crime as principle for the IC uh, BAC. And this is just an illustration of the level two categories uh, that have been created on the basis of further uh, elaboration of the frequency of the acts or the type of the act. Like for example, under psychological violence against a child, we have terrorizing a child, isolating a child, spurning, humiliating or rejecting a child, exposure of a child to domestic violence, exposure of a child to other forms of violent experience, like for instance, uh, crime and other forms of psychological violence not classified elsewhere. So I'm gonna stop here also because I am the last speaker and I know that we are running a little bit out of time, but I will be happy to answer any question you might have. Thank you so much. Thank you, and thank you, Claudia, for your presentation uh, and talking about it. So I would like to thank all of our speakers today, and I would also like to really thank our participants as well for staying with us. As uh, Claudia just mentioned, we are a bit over time, uh, so I don't think we'll have time for many questions. I think many questions that have been asked on the chat have already been replied, and if you have any questions, please uh, write them on SDG 16 Hub while the speakers can get back to them and look at them and read them and give you more detailed information about it in the coming days. Um, yes, so we do not have time for the uh, chat. Uh, we prepared some questions for the next uh, session. If my colleague can share. Okay. So first of all, thank you all for participating and for joining us on the opening webinar of this training on the Pacific. Uh, over the next few weeks, we will go more into detail about other uh, the specific indicators and all that they are agencies, which I would like to thank our co-hosting agencies uh, for organizing this training. They will be speaking about the indicators and providing us more uh, knowledge on the topic. Uh, for in, in the meanwhile, you can find some questions, some talking points and thinking points that you can um, uh, think about in, in a way so that you can get to start thinking about topics that we'll discuss next week and we will share them on the hub again uh, you will find everything there thank you so much for joining us thank you to everybody uh, at home in the office or wherever in the world and uh, have a great afternoon evening and night see you next week <laughs>